Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE, the leading cybersecurity conference. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Rob Streche. We are joined by John Holtquist. He is the chief analyst, Mandiant Intelligence Google Cloud, and Selena Larson, senior threat intelligence analyst at Proofpoint. Welcome, John and Selena. Thank you. Thank you. So you were on a panel earlier today, a keynote panel, and John, I have to tell you, your worries about the criminal use of zero days was enough to give me, me shivers. Yeah. So so why have we been seeing more financial crime groups using zero days? Well, the biggest reason is there's a lot of good money in, <laughs> in, in, in crime these days, right? So Crime uh, pays. Yeah, crime pays. I think very recently there was a disclosure of a $30 million ransom on one target. And if you look at the way that the, 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 the zero days we've seen, the way that they work, it, we're, they're all enabling access to dozens, hundreds of, of targets, and you can imagine the payout from that. Now, generally, in the past, this was like a state actor problem, right? This was like, when we talked about zero days, we generally talked about APT or cyber espionage, but if you're making that kind of money, you actually have more buying power than the state, <laughs> honestly. Okay, so, 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 but what changes have been implemented in the industry that's forcing these, these state actors, these threat actors, to use more advanced attacks like zero days? Well, I think uh, you know, we have had some success, and, and it's, a good, it's good news when they have to reach for a zero day, right? Because that means that some of the other precautions and, and controls that we've placed probably have, have had some success. Uh, and that actually means that there's probably a higher barrier to entry for, for a lot of actors, which is excellent. Um, and there's, but there are still a lot of controls that we have to we have to consider. And the good news about this process is we're learning what those controls are the hard way, but we are learning about them. Yeah, Selena, you used my favorite word, <laughs> s bombs. Oh no! <laughs> I, 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 I just I, and. I think we, we cover a lot of open source and mm -hmm. a lot of open source technology and I think part of it is looking at how you can inject things up front and we, we also see it coming in data as well. We're starting with LLMs, but we can, we'll park that for a minute. So why is it that you know, the supply chain has become such a great place for them to go and really start their attacks? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, that which we mentioned on stage, is that a lot of these organizations or the, the applications and services that are being compromised with a no-day, for example, like Move It, for example, um, Go Anywhere, things like that are not necessarily widely known. They're widely used, but you know, if you talk to kind of the average person in an enterprise, they might not even know that this is a, the type of software that's in their tech stack, right? So, so these kind of like, lesser known but widely used uh, applications and services are a really, really interesting target because they provide, like John was saying, a lot of access, widespread access. The awareness might not necessarily be at the top and also they might not even know the, uh, the types of checks that are going on with their providers or their service providers, like what, you know, to your point, open source, what open source software is being used in, these, in, this, in this equipment or in these services. And so it's, it's really easy to kind of overlook it as an enterprise, right? There's like so much focus, I think, from the APT world, if we're talking about O'Day, in Windows, in iOS, in zero-click exploits, um, but these kind of off the, off the reservation or things that people might not really know about types of tools can be very, very interesting. And like you're saying, they are enabling like the supply chain, they're enabling file transfer, they're enabling you know, sharing across various organizations. Um, and so they might not get enough scrutiny within the, the enterprise, and so they, but from threat actors, they do. Right, and I think you, and John, you even brought up the whole uh, file transfer aspect yeah. of it, and I, yeah. I think to me, you know, I mean, obviously, as people who use that quite a bit, and you start yeah. to look at it, and that that vector seems to make a lot of sense because, again, especially hot, we had some, we were talking about uh, insurance and hospitals, and they have a ton of data, a and ton, yeah. as they move to cloud, that seems like a logical attack vector. Uh, I think so, and I think. Uh, you know, I think about lawyers a lot when I think about that, right? How do you get information to lawyers? Lawyers carry a ton of sen like sensitive information. You know, one of the things that we've seen through the, through the years on the espionage side is, is that there's these third, the, the third parties that we give our most sensitive data to are also targeted. And we have to really start thinking, 
about where that data le lies, not necessarily who controls it, you know, you know, whether or not it's in our, 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 even in our system. Because frankly, if they can get it from your lawyer, they can still use it to extort you, right? And you're going to have to start thinking through a lot of that. Funny enough, it's not that privileged once it's out yeah. in the <laughs> open, right? <laughs> I mean, again. <laughs> One of the biggest takeaways that I that I got from the panel was hearing you talk about social engineering and mm. just how much of almost it's psychological warfare because they are using obsequiousness to gain your trust and, and, and make you feel good about yourself that you're being asked all these questions. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen and, and what, what really worries you when it comes to these social engineering uh, attacks? Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like there's different tiers of social engineering and stuff that we kind of really focus on, right? So there's kind of, what you would consider business email compromise, BEC, there's that sense of urgency, there's this, oh, I'm the CEO, I need this payment, or you know, we're changing our payments and stuff like that. Then you kind of go up a little bit of a level, and that's like pig butchering, and that's like kind of a bit of a romance scam. There's that social engineering kind of preying on your desire to like feel wanted or be loved, and you see kind of see that originating on a lot of different platforms, whether it's like WhatsApp or Tinder or LinkedIn, um, and those are kind of more, those are, those are financially motivated cyber criminals I hate those types of activities. But then you kind of get up a stage to the APT actors, right? And so then you have, for example, like we were talking about with North Korea, they're going after security researchers, they're going after academics, they're playing a long game. And what's really interesting is we're seeing this kind of shift across the threat landscape, largely driven by APT, but also we're seeing it on e-crime where they'll start having benign conversations with people. They'll just reach out to you. They're not going to include a link to something bad. They're not going to include a malicious attachment. They're going to reach out to you and be like, hey, I really like this paper you wrote. Like, do you have some time to talk to me about it? And really building that trust with a target. I mean, they're playing the long game, right? Like North Korea, Iran, yeah. these actors can ha spend months really cultivating a relationship before sending an actual payload. And by that point, you're in a trusted you know, conversation with them. And then that's kind of when you have your guard down and that's when you might click and install malware. Yeah. So when you have these, these, these criminals who are playing this long game and really patient, I mean, how do you solve this? Pro how do you solve a problem like North Korea? It sounds like the Sound of Music. It's, how do you, I mean, not, it's no, super the, I mean, tough, the, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. You, 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 I think uh, Maddie spoke about we have to have more controls than just the person, right? There's just there's uh, unfortunately, it's not enough to just expect the person to always, you know, like, make the right call because it's really hard to do it. These are spies, yeah. right? They're not. They're you know, good at what they they're do. They're good at what they do. Yeah. They're pay they're incentivized to do what they do. They'll spend a month, they've got the time, right? And, and they'll take their time. And, and you, ha you have to have uh, other precautions in place. It's, just, it's not enough to just expect somebody to always get it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. So I, I, I'll circle back to kind of the zero day thing. I, I used to be run product for a software company. I had to deal with Log4j and numerous other ones. And when you start to look at it and say, hey, you know, I had, a, I had a CISO ask me, a, C, a CISO CIO of a uh, hedge fund one day, I was in front of him and he goes to me, he goes, how many bugs do you ship in your product every release? And I go, I don't know, two, 300 bugs per release. And he goes to me, he goes, wow, that's the most honest answer I've ever heard. <laughs> I go, yeah, we, we get rid of the ones and the twos and we have you know, structure around the threes and the fours and we do security rankings and all of that. But Again, when you start to look at it and go, those aren't the zero days that we're getting rid of. Those mm. and so, why is it? Should we like look at zero days as just being normal going forward? Is that is is this the new norm where we're going to hear a lot more about them? I mean, it, it does depend on what kind of threat your threat model, right? I think that's important, but I think if you're an enterprise and you have data that criminals might find interesting, and you're using those t technologies that they're preying on. I think, yeah, you should consider it the norm. And, and it, let's say you're using the file transfer software, you need to have controls anticipating a zero day, right? Because, and, I, and I've had conversations with people and they're like, well, they didn't patch in time. There was no warning. They dropped on everybody's target, all these targets simultaneously. Nobody could have had that warning, so they all got popped at once. Um, if, you are, uh, if you are, especially like say in the defense sector or supporting the defense sector, I think you have a very heightened like, model and you definitely need to be worried about zero days. Uh, as you sort of get away from those places where they traditionally target, 
you have a little bit of breathing room, <laughs> but I think you know we find we find these adversaries in mysterious places all the time, <laughs> yeah. right? And I think if you're an enterprise, you really need to at least work that into your model. What would happen if they can break through this one, like for your perimeter? What's your next plan? What's the next step of your plan? Right. Well, yeah, and like kind of taking a look at what has been recently exploited. What are the zero days that are being used, both from like if if APT is in your threat model from an APT perspective, but also from a cybercrime perspective. Taking a look at the types of software and services that are being exploited. Maybe trying to do your own internal analysis where you're ranking, prioritizing. What do we look at first? Like where do we, you know put all of our resources for doing an assessment on what happens if this gets exploited, and basically using historic uh, uh, activities, dare I say intelligence, to kind of help you prioritize where you spend your time, yeah. where you spend your money, and maybe if you have the resources, to do your own pen testing, to do your own vuln research. Um, and, and I think, yeah, like it really depends, again, on your threat model, um, but making informed decisions within your own organization about where you're going to spend time based off of what we've seen historically and in the landscape, like, to John's point, FTP, that's, I mean, the file transfer stuff, that's, we're seeing a lot of that. So where, what file transfer software are you using within your own organization, and then kind of taking a step back and say, what happens if, and then go from there. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of value, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of activity at post zero day, right? And, and people are struggling to patch in time. And there's only so many resources in the world, you can keep up with only so many <laughs> zero days. So, so I think you really have to take an intelligent triage approach to which one of these zero days you're going to actually patch first, right? And that has a lot to do with what actor has access to them, how it's being used, what, how they're targeting. There's a, there, was a, there was a big difference, you remember the exchange vulnerability, for instance. That was a very unique situation where that, that vulnerability was massively valuable could get you right into down, right downtown in the network <laughs> where you wanted to be, right? And we knew that drop it, and we knew to drop everything and patch this thing, right? Because, yeah. and the other thing is that we also knew that it was being like, like the adversary had uh, like ramped up, you know, scanning for this thing suddenly. That we don't always have that level of intelligence, but we have a like there's a, there 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 are lesser, more less clear versions of that we can actually use to make these decisions. So you both painted the landscape as one where the bad actors are highly incentivized, smart, patient, um, so it, it's, it's scary. But what is giving you optimism right now? Is there anything that the defenders are doing, that, doing what particularly well, particularly from what they were doing even just a couple of years ago? So for me, the fact that cybercrime and ransomware actors even use zero days is a case for optimism for me personally because that has meant that all these threat actors have to use zero day because we're doing all these things right. So earlier you mentioned, you know, what stuff in the threat landscape has really forced behavior change. Well, macro, uh, Microsoft blocking macros by default made a huge shift. MFA everywhere means that, you know, password spraying and just getting in on exposed services isn't really the default anymore. Like it, 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 it happens less and less. Um, because the baseline of cybersecurity is increasing, there are, you know, uh, decisions that have been made by vendors, by organizations to say, hey, you know, this low hanging fruit, we're going to knock it out. So that really forces the adversaries to have to change their behavior. And the fact that they're having to use O'Day, they're, they're having to spend resources either finding it yeah. or buying it, um, which is great news. Um, and they're, you know, the stuff that they have relied on historically just isn't working anymore. I think we want to force them to innovate, right? If, if we live in a world where they don't have to innovate and they can get away with this too easily, then we are, we're not doing our jobs. But it's clear that they, they're being forced to innovate and that's, that's good to hear. What you want to hear is like, here's a new threat vector, right? That's good news. That means a lot of your other's controls are starting to work. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, John and Selena, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Strecce. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE.